of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. It spreads. It spreads. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Anbiya'i wal Mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd. All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may his peace and blessings upon his last final messenger, his family, his companions, and those who follow them until the end of times. So, alhamdulillah, last week we did not have class. As uh, all of you know, I was gone for Umrah. And um, for those of you who have not gone again, I encourage everyone to try their best to go. Uh, November is actually a very good time to go. The weather is nice and there's not as much rush. So it's actually very uh, enjoyable this time, alhamdulillah. <laughs> So I encourage everyone, if they have the means, they should try their best to go. And they've made it easier now where you can get your visa online. You don't have to literally apply for the Umrah visa. You can just get it online. It's like immediate. You can book your own ticket, your own hotel and go for it, inshallah. One year too. Yeah, one year. <laughs> Multiple entry. Mm -hmm. All right. So alhamdulillah, um, last time we were together, uh, we were exploring the lessons and meanings of verses 46 through 48. And inshallah tonight the plan is to explore the meanings and lessons of verses 49 to 51. So we'll start off like we do every week by reciting the verses themselves. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كنت تتلو من قبله من كتاب ولا تقوم بيمينك إذا لارتاب المبطلون بل هو آيات بينات في صدور الذين أوتوا العلم وما يجحد بآياتنا إلا الظالمون وقالوا لولا أنزل عليه آيات من ربه قل إنما الآيات عند الله وإنما أنا نذير مبين أولم يكفهم أن أنزلنا عليك الكتاب يتلى عليهم إن في ذلك لرحمة وذكرى لقوم يؤمنون. So the last time we were together, uh, we ended our discussion. Uh, on verse number 48, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's responding to one of the objections of the Quraysh by highlighting the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ إِذَا لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْطِلُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's speaking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He's saying that you, O Prophet, have never been reciting any book before this, nor have you been writing it with your right hand. Had it been so, the adherents of falsehood would have raised doubts. So we spoke about how when the Quraysh first heard the Qur'an, they recognized that it was not the product of human effort. They realized that it was not human in origin and that it had to be divine. They recognized that the Qur'an doesn't resemble any other type of literature. It is neither similar to prose nor poetry. That when the Prophet ﷺ would receive revelation and then he would recite it to the people of Quraysh, automatically, immediately they knew that these words were divine in nature. That they were miraculous and they were unique. Even the greatest poets during the time of the Prophet ﷺ admitted that it was something else. That these were not the words of a poet or an ordinary man. So in our last session, we went through one example. That one of the most famous poets of Mecca admitted that these were the words of divine origin. He had to admit that there was something special about this. So there's another famous story of Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. So Utbah, once he was sitting with other members of the Quraysh, and the topic of Muhammad ﷺ came up. And this would happen quite often. Muhammad ﷺ, the last and final messenger, was literally the talk of the town. Right? Oftentimes when they would come together and they would have gatherings, they would discuss the Prophet ﷺ. So the elders of Quraysh, 
they began complaining about all the problems that this new message had caused among their people. And they started to discuss various ways that they could rid themselves of this irritating problem. So Utbah suggested that perhaps the Prophet ﷺ could be convinced of giving up his message. If only it was explained to him in a gentle manner the problems that his message had been causing. So common sense, Utbah argued, would prevail. And as proof of his convictions, he himself volunteered to be the one to go and speak to the Prophet ﷺ. He's like, look, if one of us goes and speaks to him rationally and calmly with gentleness, and we explain to him that this new message you're preaching and this new way of life that you are calling people towards is creating problems in our society, perhaps he will listen to us and perhaps he will be convinced to stop preaching his message. So he therefore set out to meet the Prophet ﷺ and he started to try to convince him to abandon preaching this new message and let the Quraysh return to the paganism of their ancestors. And after finishing his plea to the Prophet ﷺ, he sallallahu alayhi wa asked, Have you finished, O Abu al-Walid? Right, this was the kunya, this was the nickname of Utbah. So when he replied in the affirmative, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Then listen to me. And he recited, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Hamim, Tanzilum min al Rahmanir Rahim, Kitabun fussilat ayatuhu Quran al Arabiya li qawmi ya'lamun, Bashirahu wa nadira. فَأَعْرَضَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ That in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the very merciful. حَامِيم تَنْزِيلٌ مِّنَ الرَّحْمَانِ الرَّحِيمِ This is a revelation from the absolutely most merciful, الرَّحِيمِ, the bestower of mercy. كِتَابٌ فُصِّلَتْ آيَاتُ This is a book whose verses are explained in full detail. قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لِقَوْمِ يَعْنَمُونَ a Qur'an in Arabic for people who reflect. Bashira wa nadira, Giving glad tidings as well as warnings. فَأَعْرَضَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ But most of them turn away so they do not listen. And the Prophet ﷺ continued to recite until he finished the particular surah. In Utbah, he sat quietly entranced by what he was hearing. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, you have heard what you have heard, so now do as you please. And in Utbah, when he was listening to the Prophet ﷺ, he was completely mesmerized. He was completely entranced. He could not move. He was paying 100% attention. So when Utbah returned to his people, to the leaders of Quraysh, they noticed that something was different. So they said that, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, this Utbah is not the same as the Utbah that left us. That when Utbah went to go speak to the Prophet ﷺ, he went with full confidence that he would be able to convince him to stop preaching his message. But now he's come back with a completely different attitude. Right? His face changed, his demeanor changed. And indeed it was not the same. Um, he said, O oh people, I have heard a speech, the like of which I have never heard before. I swear by Allah, it is not magic, nor is it poetry, nor is it sorcery. O people of Quraysh, listen to me. Leave this man alone. For I swear by Allah, the speech that I have heard from him in the Qur'an will soon be news among the other tribes. Meaning that the Qur'an will be the cause of some great event among the Arabs. So even Utbah, who was among the leadership of Quraysh, someone who wanted to stop the Prophet ﷺ from preaching his message. When he heard the Qur'an being recited, he had to admit, he had to recognize that this was something absolutely unique, that this was something totally and completely different, that it was divine and miraculous in nature. So basically he goes back to Quraysh and he's telling them, leave him alone. Let him continue preaching because he's definitely receiving revelation from the heavens. Right? Another companion, Unais al-Ghifari, was also one of the many people who clearly saw the beauty of the Qur'an. Unais was one of the famous poets of Arabia. And he once went to Mecca to do some trading and happened to come across the Prophet ﷺ and listen to him reciting the Qur'an. And he was so attracted to his recitation that he was delayed from returning to his caravan. And when he finally arrived, he was asked the reason for his delay. He responded, I have met a person in Mecca who claims to be sent by Allah. The people claim that he's a poet, 
or a sorcerer or a magician. Yet I have heard the words of sorcerers, and these words in no way resemble those uttered by a sorcerer. And I also compared his words to the verses of a poet, but such words cannot be uttered by a poet. By Allah, he is the truthful, and they are the liars. So basically, the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, as soon as they heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting the Qur'an, they recognized deep down inside of their hearts that it was divine and miraculous in nature. They recognized that, but because of their arrogance, because of their pride, because of their stubbornness, sometimes because of their ignorance, they refused to accept it. Right? They recognized it, they acknowledged it deep down inside of their hearts, but they refused to accept it. Now part of what added to the miracle and uniqueness of the Qur'an is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was unlettered. That he is known as an nabiyul ummi right? The Prophet ﷺ, one of the nicknames or one of the titles that's given to him is the unlettered Prophet. Meaning he did not know how to read or write. So the Prophet ﷺ, he did not attend any school and he also wasn't known for composing poetry or any other type of literature. Because if he was, then the Quraysh could have used that as a means to doubt the authorship of the Qur'an. They could have objected and said that these words that you are reciting are your own, or that you learned it from previous scriptures and people. But they themselves knew that the Prophet ﷺ was unlettered, and that this was impossible. But interestingly, this is exactly one of the doubts or objections that were initially brought up by the people of Quraysh. That they said that you made these words up yourself, right? That you invented these words yourself, you composed them yourself, or that you learned them from previous nations and previous people. But this doubt or objection held no weight because every single person in Mecca knew that this wasn't true. They knew that the Prophet ﷺ was Ummi. They knew that he was unlettered. Because the Prophet ﷺ had lived among them all his life, and they knew that he could neither read nor write. Then he gave them this remarkable book, which was unlike anything produced by even the most talented of literary figures. Now they might have had a reasonable suspicion had the Prophet ﷺ been a man of literally talent. But what doubt could they reasonably entertain when they were fully aware of his past among them? And one of the Mufassirun, they write that furthermore, even if the Prophet ﷺ could read and write, they should not have entertained any doubt about it. Because the Qur'an is its own best witness, that it has no human author. It is far greater than man's ability, knowledge, and world. Whenever one reflects on its statements, one cannot escape the feelings that it is too powerful and too authoritative to be of human composition. So to remove any doubts whatsoever, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes that the Qur'an is definitely recitation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 49, بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا الظَّالِمُونَ Nay, but this Qur'an consists of verses that are clear to the hearts of those gifted with real knowledge. And no one knowingly rejects our revelations other than the wrongdoers. So بَلْ, rather, هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ Right, clear, unequivocal, clear verses and signs. Fi suduri ladina utul in, in the hearts of those gifted with knowledge. Wama yajhadu bi ayatina, and no one rejects, no one denies our signs. Illa zaniun, except the wrongdoers. Right, so the Quran it consists of verses that are absolutely clear unequivocal and unambiguous pointing towards the truth and providing guidance, especially for those that have been granted true knowledge. Ayatun bayinat. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this phrase quite often throughout the entire Qur'an. So the word ayat is the plural of the word ayah, and we translate ayah as verse. But ayah is referring to a sign. And the reason why the verses of the Qur'an are called ayat, because every single verse is a sign of the existence and the magnificence, the might, the glory and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these signs, bayinat, they are clear, they are unambiguous, they are unequivocal. They have no doubts whatsoever regarding the divine origin of the Qur'an. Right? So these unambiguous signs 
that are absolutely clear, they point towards the truth and they provide guidance, especially for those that have been granted knowledge. Right? Fi sudur ladina utul These verses are clear within the hearts of people that have been given true knowledge. And here what it means is knowledge and recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? They have no doubts whatsoever regarding the divine origin of the Qur'an and that these are the eternal, uncreated, powerful, eloquent, beautiful and transformative words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا That no one rejects our signs إِلَّا ظَالِمُونَ Except for the wrongdoers. Those who wrong themselves through their own pride, arrogance, ignorance and stubbornness. So it is from the infinite divine wisdom and way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whenever He sent a prophet or a messenger, He aided them with clear miracles and signs that prove their prophethood. Right? This is the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created from the time of Adam alayhi salam. That whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would appoint a prophet and a messenger, He would give them certain miracles. And these miracles would be used to prove that they were telling the truth, that they were definitely receiving revelation from the heavens. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave all of His Prophets amazing miracles, clear proofs and manifest signs that they were telling the truth without a doubt and that they were chosen by Allah. And each Prophet and Messenger was given a miracle or miracles that were appropriate for their particular circumstances, environment and time something that would have the greatest impact on that particular nation. So during the time of Musa salam, for example, magic was very prevalent. It was a very prevalent practice and it was considered to be a particular science or discipline. So he was given the miracle of the staff that turned into a snake and the miracle of the hand that turned into a shining light because this would be an impactful evidence, an impactful miracle upon that society, upon that community that was impressed by magic. They say that during the time of Isa السلام, medicine was considered to be extremely valuable and anyone with medical knowledge was regarded highly. So Isa السلام, was given the miracle of being able to cure the sick and bring the dead back to life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose and selected the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to receive the greatest of all miracles, which is the Qur'an. Right? The Qur'an is this divine light. It is heavenly revelation that Allah revealed upon the heart of our Prophet ﷺ. It is known as the everlasting miracle. Right? It is known as the Al-Mu'jizatul Kharida. The everlasting miracle of the Prophet ﷺ that completely changed the history of the world and revolutionized an entire nation of people. And that is something very, very powerful and very significant to think about. The, the moment the Prophet ﷺ received revelation in the cave of Hira, the entire history of mankind changed forever. That was one of the greatest moments in the history of all of humanity. That this connection between the heavens and the earth was re-established. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed his own words, his own speech to the Prophet ﷺ through the angel Jibreel. Right? And it created an unprecedented change in the lives of the companions radiallahu anhum. It brought them to life and created such a society and generation the like of which has never been seen before in history. So it elevated a people who were known as an illiterate nation. They were known as shepherds and desert dwellers to the thrones of the Roman and Persian empires. A poet remarked in praise of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and this is actually very beautiful, right? This is a, a, a couplet or a, a, a portion of poetry that is praising the Prophet sallallahu alaihi Right, the poet says, "Your brother Isa alayhi salam called upon a corpse, and it stood for him, and it came to life. And you brought generations to life from non-existence. Right, generations meaning you brought people back to iman, generation after generation through the miracle of the Quran. That Isa alayhi salam he was given this one miracle, and through this miracle he was able to bring one person back to life." But through the miracle of the Qur'an, you brought generations of people back to life through Iman, right? Through faith and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now part of the greatness of the Qur'an, it comes from the fact that it is an everlasting and permanent miracle. That it's a miracle that all of us 
can experience and recognize till this day. But the unique thing about the Qur'an is that it is not necessarily a physical miracle. That when you look at all of the miracles that were given to prophets in the past, they were these physical manifestations of the might and power and glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were things that were khilaf al-ada. Right? They went against the natural order and, and system of this world. But the miracle that's given to the Prophet ﷺ in the form of the Qur'an, it is more intellectual and spiritual than it is physical. And the Prophet ﷺ himself told us that every Prophet was given miracles because of which people believed. But what I have been given is divine inspiration, which Allah has revealed to me. So I hope that my followers will outnumber the followers of other prophets on the day of resurrection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِّن رَبِّي They say, why aren't signs sent down to him from his Lord? وَقَالُوا meaning the people of Quraysh. They make this objection. لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِّن رَبِّي Why isn't the Prophet ﷺ being given these physical miracles from his Lord? قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Respond and say, the signs are only with Allah. وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ And I am only a clear warner. أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ And is it not sufficient, is it not enough for them that we reveal to you the book that is recited to them? إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَرَحْمَةً وَذِكْرَى لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Truly in that is a mercy and a reminder for a people who believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is saying that the Qur'an is sufficient. The Qur'an is enough as a miracle for the people. And it is the greatest miracle that has been given to any prophet. It is the most powerful miracle given to any prophet that will have the greatest effect on the hearts and minds of people. And the Prophet ﷺ was also given other miracles besides the Qur'an. Right? For example, the miracle of splitting the moon in half, the increase of an inadequate amount of food to a very large quantity, the speaking of stones, animals, and trees to him, water sprouting from his hands, and many others. But none of these miracles was permanent. They happened at a particular time, and they were only for the people who witnessed them and experienced them. They occurred in front of specific people during a specific time and place. Now part of the beauty and power of the miraculous nature of the Qur'an is that it's not restricted by time or place. That past prophets were given physical miracles, that were appropriate for their time and their circumstances. And this is where we recognize the difference between the miracle of the Qur'an and the miracles of other prophets. That the Qur'an is this everlasting miracle whose miraculous nature can be witnessed by everyone till this day and until this world comes to an end. But again, in order for us to actually feel and experience and recognize and acknowledge the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, it's important for us to understand the language. Because the real miracle of the Qur'an is in the language of the Qur'an. In its elegance, its beauty, its perfection, its power, its profound nature, the deep meanings and lessons and morals and guidance that it contains. That the Qur'an is extremely, extremely deep. They say it's بَحْرٌ لَا سَاحِرَ لَهُ It's an ocean that has no shore. So the only way that we can truly feel the power of the Qur'an and recognize its beauty, its eloquence, its miraculous nature, is if we actually understand the Qur'an in its native language, in the language in which it was revealed. And we can get a taste of the miraculous nature by reading translations, and by reading tafasir and learning about the Qur'an. Right? We get a taste of its miraculous nature. But the real miracle of the Qur'an can only be experienced if one understands the language of the Qur'an. Now, despite witnessing and experiencing the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, the people of Quraysh remained stubborn upon their disbelief because of their arrogance and pride. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ to show them some sort of physical miracle similar to those that were given to the Prophets that came before them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 50, وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِّن رَبِّي قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ They say, they meaning the people of Quraysh, why have no miraculous signs ever been bestowed upon him from on high by his Lord? قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ 
say signs are only with Allah. وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ And I am only a clear and open and plain warner. So the people of Quraysh, out of their disbelief, their enmity, their opposition and hatred, they would say that لَوْلَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِّن رَبِّي Why have no miraculous signs um, been given to him from his Lord? If he's telling the truth, if he's truly a prophet chosen by Allah, then why hasn't he received a physical miracle similar to the prophets that came before him? That why hasn't he been given a she-camel like Salih a.s.? Why hasn't he been given a staff like Musa a.s.? Or why hasn't he been given a ma'idah, that table spread, like Isa a.s.? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself tells the Prophet ﷺ to respond to this ridiculous statement by saying, قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ That say signs are only with Allah. Meaning that I as a Prophet and Messenger, I'm not the one who performs these miracles. I only perform these miracles with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if He wants for me to have these physical manifestations as miracles, then He would do so. What is my responsibility? إِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ I am only a plain warner. That I was sent to warn you about your immorality and your false beliefs and your destructive way of life. I was sent to warn you about punishment in the hereafter and warn you and remind you about the reality of this world and the world to come. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is the one who sends down miracles and signs. I am only a plain warner. My responsibility is to warn you against a punishment if you remain stubborn upon your disbelief. So the Prophet ﷺ, his responsibility was to convey the message. وَمَا عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا الْبَلَاغِ right, The Prophet ﷺ's responsibility was to convey the message to his community, to all of mankind, clearly without any doubts or ambiguity. And once the Prophet ﷺ fulfilled this responsibility, once he delivered and conveyed the message, he fulfilled his responsibility, and now the decision was in the hands of the ones who received the message. They had the option to accept it or to reject it. And they would ultimately be responsible and accountable for whatever decision they made. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Kahf, right, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whom, Whomsoever Allah guides, or different verse, Whomsoever Allah guides is the one who gets the right path, and whomsoever He lets go astray, for Him you will find no one to help and no one to lead. And similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah that it is not for you, O Prophet, to guide them. It is Allah who guides whomsoever He wills. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَرَحْمَةً وَذِكْرَى لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ Is it not enough for them? Is it not sufficient for them? That we have revealed to you this book. Awalam yakfihim. That this Quran in and of itself, that you are reciting to them, should be sufficient for them. Right? In terms of its miraculous nature, in terms of its beauty and eloquence and power, in terms of its you know its its, its awe and meanings and guidance and lessons and morals, yakfihim. It should have been enough to them. That anna anzalna alayka al-kitab, that we reveal this book upon you, yutla alayhim. That's being read to them. Inna fi dhalika la rahma wa dhikra li qawmi yu'minun. And truly in that, meaning truly in the revelation of the Quran, truly in the Quran, la rahma. There is divine, infinite mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And dhikra and a reminder, li qawmi yu'minun for the people who believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that don't pay attention to any of their objections, right? Don't mind their objections, don't be bothered by them, don't be troubled by them. They are simply running their mouths because of their arrogance and their pride and their stubbornness. That they know and they recognize that the Qur'an is definitely coming from the heavens. They know that these aren't words that you made up yourself. They know that these are not the words of a magician or the words of a poet or the words of a sorcerer. They know without a doubt that these are my words, the words of... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this should be sufficient for them. And take solace and be content with the fact that this Qur'an is rahmah. It is a divine, infinite mercy for those of your 
people who believe in you, for your companions, for the Sahaba, and anyone that comes after. That the Quran is one of the greatest expressions of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down into this universe. Because it is through the Quran that we as human beings recognize and understand and know what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Right? Part of this rahmah is that it guides us towards living a life that is pleasing to Him and how to attain salvation. Right? It gives us that path towards uh, eternal salvation. وَذِكْرَى And it is a reminder right, for us. It reminds us once again about our own personal reality. It reminds us about our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself. It reminds us about life after death, accountability, reward and punishment, paradise and hell. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that those individuals that truly, truly benefit from the guidance and mercy of the Qur'an are the people of taqwa. Right? The people who are conscious and mindful of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Hudallil muttaqin. That the Qur'an is a guidance for the people of God consciousness. So, inna fi thalika la rahma wa dhikra li qawmi yu'minun. Alright, so essentially in this passage, uh, we are learning about the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. And there are several books, right? There are several works um, within our tradition that have been composed and compiled and written on the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Right, this discipline is known as I'jaz al-Qur'an, the inimitable, miraculous nature of the Qur'an. And the scholars, they mention wujuhu al-I'jaz, that what are some of the ways and what are some of the, 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 the aspects of miraculous nature of the Qur'an. And these are things that all of us should study and should understand and should know so that we have confidence in the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Now again, a lot of it has to do with linguistics. A lot of it has to do with language and understanding Arabic and how the Qur'an does not resemble any other Arabic literature that existed previously nor that exists today. In terms of its style, in terms of its syntax and grammar and structure, in terms of how, it's, it's, how it conveys particular meanings and the usage of words and language, it is absolutely unique. And that is why the Arabs of the time, whose expertise was the Arabic language, who prided themselves in the language, recognized that the Qur'an was unique. They recognized that it was divine in nature and miraculous in nature. Now, for us um, that, that, that don't know the Arabic language, you know, part of the miracle of the Qur'an that we can at least find comfort and solace in is the divine protection of the Qur'an. That every single word we're reciting, uh, we can have absolute 100% conviction that these were the exact same words revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that this divine protection is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself guarantees and is something that we can witness till this day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this divine protection when he says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. That truly we are the ones who revealed the reminder. Wa inna lahu lahafidhun. And truly we are there to protect it. We are there to safeguard it. We are there to preserve it. And that is why the Qur'an cannot be altered, it cannot be changed. There can be no additions, there can be no deletions. There can be no, uh, you know, people cannot basically mess with the Qur'an. Right? It is divinely protected, it is divinely preserved. Primarily in the hearts of human beings, but also on pages in these masahif, in these copies of the Qur'an. So we will end here for tonight, inshaAllah. And next Wednesday we will pick up from verse number... Uh, 52 insha'Allah um, Are there any questions On these particular verses? Mm -hmm. It's a different place if Allah says uh, Allah guides whoever he wants So if the question comes So if someone say oh, Allah is not guiding me So how can I You know Say or yeah. start What is the answer for this type yeah. of question? So, so our understanding of hidayah is that yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives hidayah. But we as human beings also do things that earn us that hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't know who he's guiding or who he's misguiding. Our responsibility is to work. Because we don't know what the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, what the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. As human beings, our responsibility is to put forth the effort. Okay.
Right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from us. May He place on our scale of good deeds on the Day of Judgment. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.